Everyone say, God bless Pastor Darling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I received those blessings. God bless you, Pastor Handsome. You don't have to say that. I know it's just, just awkward. <laughs> um, I got a special, a special message, sorry, a special message this morning from Pastor Sammy, who couldn't be with us. She's still recovering from her, her broken arm. But uh, she wanted me to say especially that she agrees with all of this. And she thanks all those people who worked in her team and worked in this church. So she, she would have loved to be here to appreciate also um, all our volunteers. So be thinking of her and send her a message and let her know that uh, you love her too. So amen to that. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you have such good things for this church. Lord God, I, I commend her to you, Lord God. Look, look at her, Lord God, shining like the sun. These, every chair filled with a world changer, someone ready to hear your word and do what you say, Lord God. Father God, we ask that you would come and lead us and grace us with more of your presence, Lord God. As we open up the word today, Lord God, would you, would you help us, Lord God, to walk in your ways in a way that there is joy in our hearts, Lord God, that it would not be obligation, but it would be life. And it would not only be life to us, but it would be life to the people around us. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. I also wanted to mention this. Um, you know we've, we've danced in worship two weeks in a row. How are you feeling about that? I know there are some people here that are loving it. There are some people here, I know a few personally, that are heck. That's, that's rough. I just, I, I, you know, I'm just getting used to like, using my hands a little bit, but now you actually want me to use my feet as well. So I want, I want to say to all of you that worship is a voluntary thing. You know that. So, so when our um, worship team does these fantastic dances, which I want to say I just love, I want to do them every time, please keep on with the dancing. But if you don't like to dance, my friends, don't dance. You're fine. You're so fine. You know, maybe, maybe try out a little thing, a new thing every time, but, but you're free to worship God in the way that makes you connect with him the best. That's what we're after. We're after connection with Jesus. So if dancing helps you connect with him, it helps me. It makes me feel joyful. It kind of gives expression to the joy in my heart. And so for me, when I, when I dance, I can feel Jesus' pleasure. For some of you, when you dance, all you feel is pain. Feel free to not dance. It's so fine. I mean, Pila did that thing yesterday, last week, where you had to go down. And, you know, I got down and I thought, heck, I don't know if I'm getting up. <laughs> so, you know, you manage yourself. Manage your own, manage your own personal um, well-being. We, we respect that and we honor that. But thank you, worship teams. You're amazing. You're absolutely amazing. We, we love how you give us an opportunity to worship God with abandon. We're so, so grateful. So we are continuing with our Live Connected series. Uh, Pastor Roger did a fabulous job of talking about living in community and taking your place in God's in God's people and standing your ground in that. And so if you didn't hear that, we would love you to just go ahead and uh, listen to that on YouTube or on the podcast because it really was fabulous. We are going to be talking about living connected to your destiny through the word today. So I'm trusting that as we do this, you, you, will, you will feel a new, um, a new desire and joy for scripture. And you would see how it leads you into something new. How many of you, if I offered you a pill, and if you took this pill daily, your feelings of loneliness would drop by 30%. Your anger issues would drop by 32%. I know some of you are going to give that pill to someone else. Bitterness in relationships would drop by 40%. Alcoholism would drop by 57%. Sexual dysfunction drops by 68%. I know none of you need that. Feeling emotionally stagnant would drop by 60%. How many of you would be prepared to take this pill daily? I mean, I, I don't know if I want you to raise your hands because we all realize that's the loneliness that you're putting your hand up for. So, you know, the, 
the bottom line is I don't think there's a person in the world that wouldn't want to take this pill. And all you have to do is just take this pill daily and all those fabulous things would happen. So this is actually research done by a, a very reputable research company that was relayed by Lifeway Group. And they found that people who read their Bible daily for at least four days a week experienced this. I know. Take the pill, my friends. Take the pill. It's right there. I know. Give, give, give the Lord a hand. He, he did a good thing. He did a good thing. So I want to take us to a passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy 3. And it is Paul writing to one of the men he has mentored. And they, this particular man, is now pastoring and leading a church that Paul planted. And Paul is now no longer with him. He's, he wrote two letters to him, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Obviously, we're in the second one. And in the, in the middle of this, he says this to, to him. He's, be, he's been um, telling them about, telling Timothy about people who were falling away from God and, and not doing well. And he says then, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want you to notice there that some phrases that I, I want to kind of hone in on. It says that the holy scriptures that he had known for generations that had been passed on to him in his infancy were able to make him wise for salvation. Please take note of that. Also, these same scriptures were useful to him for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that he and all of us could be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I know all of you would love to be ready to do good things every day. I mean, isn't, isn't that amazing that, that this, this scripture can actually make you ready for good things? At the same time, it appears that it makes us wise. It, it somehow enters into our brains and makes us better people, wiser people. And I know all of you, it's like, yes, please, bring it on. That, that would be fantastic. Uh, to know how to answer to someone, to know how to respond to situations, we would all want that. But I want you to notice, right in the middle of these two phrases, is a profound thing. It says there, all scripture is God-breathed. We're going to get to the ones on either side of this in a moment. But I want to focus and begin with this, this particular phrase. All scripture is God-breathed. You know, that's a profound thing. I mean, literally what Paul is saying is that the Bible that we have with us, that we read every day, that, that God's breath actually entered into human beings and inspired them to write this. I mean, that's a huge, huge statement. They weren't just sitting there and they'd enjoyed the meal, so they suddenly thought, oh, these, this sounds nice, let me write this down. That actually God came and partnered with them, entered into them, breathed into them, and out came the scriptures. I mean, that's a huge, huge statement. Interestingly enough, God breathed, that, that phrase in the Greek, is not used anywhere else in the New Testament. Paul didn't use it any other time, only here. He was, he was making a very unique statement. When I read it, it absolutely takes me back to something. Does it take you back to something? Some of you are saying, yes, some of you are looking at me completely blankly, so let me put you out of your misery. It takes me right back to Genesis. Because the other time where you hear or you read about, should I say rather, God breathing is right at the beginning when he created mankind. And it says that the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So it's almost like the same mechanism by which God created human beings, made us into the image of God, people who could, could uh, interact with God on a face-to-face on a -face basis, sort of, and could, could have this kind of intense and beautiful relationship with him. 
In the same way that he created us, it's the same way that he created scripture. I mean, that's a profound and big thing. And what it literally means is that that when we read scripture, that breath of God is kind of coming to us across the generations, out, out of those words, into our lives, and recreating us. It's like a mechanism that created in the first place and now recreates us. I know, that's fantastic. Read your Bibles every day. But, but another time Paul was writing in, in Ephesians and he said this, that, that Jesus um, sanctifies or purifies the church, us, by the washing of the water of the word. So it's a, it's a theme that actually runs through the Bible, that there's a way in which God's word, scripture, actually changes us when we read it. You know, just before I got saved, or sometime before I got saved, I, I had this problem. Did you have any problems before you knew Jesus? I mean, I had lots. Luckily, I have a few less now, but I still have problems. But God's working on them. But where, when I, before I saved, I had this problem. Like when, when I would drive down the road, and in those days, they used to put the newspaper headlines on like little billboards on all the lampposts. And you would drive down and you'd hear about the war in this country. You'd hear about this abused child. You'd hear about those killings. And you know, you were just bombarded lamppost off the lamppost by bad news. And I found, I found it traumatizing. Honestly, I like, I, I mean, you can't close your eyes when you're driving, but I was tempted. It's just like I would have to like not look at them because it, I felt like I was being bombarded by just evil. Bam, 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 every lamppost. The other day, I, we don't really put them on the lamppost anymore, but I was, I was scrolling through uh, my news channel on my phone and bam, 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 all the, you know, <laughs> bad news, <laughs> bad news was coming up. But, you know, as it was coming up, something so totally different happened in my heart. Instead of me feeling assaulted by the evil, it's just like something inside of me rode up and said, no! And I started like praying and just declaring over these things, and I could feel like the presence of God in me assaulting evil. It's like before evil, evil used to assault me. Now I, it's like I was assaulting evil. It was just like, yes, I can, I can feel this. And I thought to myself, wow, this is a huge change. It like shocked me. And I thought, when in these decades did, did I change? And I can't tell you when the change happened. All I can tell you is that daily from the time I knew Jesus, I've been reading my Bible. And every time I read the Bible, something small in my life changes. Sometimes, you know, sometimes when you read the Bible, it's like moonshine and roses. It's like orchestras playing. It's like a revelation burst into your mind. It's fantastic. It's like, wow. And, you know, other times you read the Bible, you just read the Bible. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just you, you get through the words. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, uh, maybe that never happens to you. But I have some mornings when I'm just reading the words. And, I, and to be honest, I've ticked the box and I can go and have breakfast. I mean, that's just, sorry, guys. I, I, hope, I know you thought we, we cavort with angels every day. But <laughs> we just do it normally, every, every way, like human beings. But, but what I've noticed that even when I'm not feeling it, Something's happening. It's like actually working on my mindsets. It's rearranging my brain. It's like rewiring things. And incrementally, day by day by day by day, I'm changing. And when I look back over the years, I think, wow, how did that happen? How did I become this person when I used to be that person? But I can't tell you when the change happened. I can just tell you that daily something is happening. And the problem is, if you get discouraged and think, oh, that reading that today was just, it was just a nothing. Why, do I, why should I even do this? Then what happens is you get down to decades later when you haven't been reading your Bible and there's been no change, but you can't go back and redo those decades. Because that's how God changes us incrementally day by day. I mean, he has a few big jumps every now and then when it's a wow moment. But the most usual way he changes us is a daily incremental interchange between us and him through his word. 
Okay, now, I think you got it. Scripture is God-breathed. But there's something, I mean, and that's nice, and it's beautiful, and it really helps me to see something lovely when I think of it like that. But I have to also deal with a little bit more difficult thing. Are you okay with that? Is that when I think about all Scripture being God-breathed, it says they're all Scripture. Did you see that? That's like every word, every single word. Guys, have you read the Bible? I mean, there's some stuff in there that it's like, I don't know how to breathe that. I mean, that's hectic. I mean, I'm thinking of some of those wars where they wiped out everyone. I'm thinking of some of the leaders who, uh, you know, just were serial adulterers. Like they had like hundreds of wives, hundreds of concubines. You know, it's just like, heck. I mean, I'm reading of some of the things in like the first five books of the Bible where literally my daughter came to me one day when she was reading and she said, Mom, the Bible really doesn't like women, does it? <laughs> you know, it, it, it sometimes, guys, uh, maybe you don't have this feeling, I, I know you don't, but sometimes when us women read some of those things, it's like, whoa. So it says here, all scripture is God-breathed. But we have a dilemma, because if you go around telling people about Jesus, one of the most common objections you're going to hear is, but have you read the Bible? It's got all these hectic things. God wiped out entire nations. That's just genocide. How can I lo love and serve a God like this? Have you, have you come across that? If you haven't, you just haven't gotten to the right people. They're out there in their hundreds. So... So can we take some time to just look that problem square in the face? So let's look at some apologetics for the hard parts of Scripture. Are you okay with that? I obviously can't go through every passage because most of the passages in the Bible are fantastic. But, so, you know, there are enough of them where it will take you a while to get through the, the difficult ones. So I'm going to give you four principles that will help you navigate those difficult passages. So let's first look at commentary versus history. So you see, when we read the Bible, we often think that it all being God-breathed means that God is approving of and saying good and well done to every single thing that's in the Bible. That, that's what God breathed means. We often think that, but that's not at all what it means. You see, sometimes he is giving commentary. He is saying, this is the way to live, and this is not the way to live. They are very clear passages. But sometimes God is just laying out history. He's just telling you what happened without any commentary at all. Why could he do this? He could do this because the Bible, especially the Old Testament, was written specifically to the Jewish people. And every Jewish person was expected from childhood to know the law. That means it was expected that when they read that David had hundreds of wives and hundreds of concubines, that they would read it through the lens of the law and they would know Adultery is not a good thing. So they, when they saw that happening, they wouldn't go, oh gosh, look, we can have many wives. See, God wrote it here and it's in his Bible, so that means I can do it. No, they would read it and say, heck, he's got that many wives, something bad's happening, going to happen. Because I know from the law that this is not the right way to do it. And we do see the outplaying in his family of just devastation. And they go at the end of it, see, God was right. Don't commit adultery. One wife, one husband, it's God's way. So you see, sometimes it's commentary. Sometimes it's just history that is meant to be read through the backdrop of God's values. We are meant to come to the conclusions that doing it not God's way leads to disaster. Doing it God's way leads to blessing. The next thing is cultural context. Guys, I just want to ask you a question. Do you think if God came to Moses and said, listen, Moses, I'm going to tell you about the creation of the world. 
Guys, I made photons. And then I made atoms, and I, I had nuclei, and I had um, protons and neutrons there, and then I had these little things called electrons, and, and then, you know, and we make different charges, and they all come together. And actually, guys, there's these weak um, forces and these strong forces, and do you, what do you think Moses would have done? I think he would have buried his head in the sand and said, you're, you're on your own, Lord. You're on your own, Lord. Do you understand that? So we have to understand this. I'm going to make a statement that I think will help you. Is the Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. It was written to an ancient people. And God, when he spoke to those ancient people, had to use language that they could understand. Because otherwise, what would be the point of speaking to them? He certainly used language that could be understood across the generations, but he had to start with the first people he was speaking to. And he had to use language that they could understand because he was leading them there in a very particular context. So when we read the Bible, we can't read it from a 21st century point of view. You have to step into the shoes of the people who were hearing it for the first time. And it cannot, cannot, cannot mean anything that it didn't mean to them. And so we absolutely have to go back and look at, for instance, the Genesis story of creation and read it from the perspective of a people who were awash with myths of creation about all these gods and listen and see, heck, it's saying to them there is only one God and this one God created the world. And he did it systematically. He brought order out of chaos and he established everything for the purpose of dwelling on earth with mankind. That's what we must read out of that. If you want more, we actually are going to do an apologetics course next year in the May around then um, in our equip season. So if you want more detail about this, we'll go into more detail. I know my, now I'm just whetting your appetite. The next is boundaries of freedom. God made us free. Do you know that God made us free? Isn't that glorious? I mean, he could have make a, made us automations, but he made us free beings with f choice. But there are limits to our freedom. We have one of the greatest objections to the Bible you will ever get is how could God wipe out all those nations? When Israel took, went into the promised land and wiped those, those nations, how could he do that? That's xenophobic genocide. So in Genesis 15, it says a very interesting thing. God comes to Abraham and he says this. He says, you know what? I am going to bring you back to this land, but not now. Because right now, the sins of the Amorites are not complete. So what he was actually saying is, guys, these guys are not bad enough for me to take their land away from them. Four hundred years he left those Amorites and the nations of Canaan living their lives. I am absolutely convinced we have enough um, evidence from the Bible that God was interacting with those nations as he could to try to bring them to repentance. How do I know this? Because there were elements of those nations who did align themselves with Israel when Israel came to their borders. And they, they, uh, they uh, associated with the covenant that God had given um, Israel, and God incorporated them into the blessings, and they weren't wiped out. But we have from history that these Canaanite nations, by the time Israel arrived, they were mind-blowingly debauched, sacrificing their children regularly to these foreign gods. And you know what? I want to tell you this, that God gives you freedom, but there is a limit to your freedom. God will allow sin to happen to a point, and then he will say no more. And what this has got to speak to us, guys, is that there is a fear of the Lord in our hearts, is that we can't just live how we want to. We must live within the parameters of God's, God's ideal for this earth. And if we don't, we have an example 
that God finally says to this nation, I've given you 400 years. I've been yearning with you. I've given you opportunity. Now, no more. I must have people in this nation who will, in this land who will serve me so that I can bring my Messiah. I hope that's helpful to you. And then the last thing I want to say is that Jesus is the word. So all of those very difficult passages in the Old Testament, they must be read through the lens of Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? Is that Jesus interpreted the Old Testament and came up with a particular lifestyle. And he lived that. He said he was fulfilling the whole of the law. In other words, if you read the Old Testament and come to any other conclusion other than the lifestyle of Jesus, you're reading the Old Testament wrong. Because Jesus is the expression of God's word, um, word on earth. And so everything we look at in the Old Testament, we must read through the lens of Jesus Christ. Amen. Does that help you? <laughs> it says there, it makes you wise for salvation. Guys, I wanted to just m mention this, that the word of God makes you, the scripture makes you wise for salvation. It doesn't mean that every time you read it, you have to get saved again. Are you okay with that? Because the, the word for salvation actually in Hebrew culture was a very broad thing. It means God saves you in every way. He saves you so that you go to heaven when you die. He saves you so that you belong to his kingdom. But, but also he, he begins a process of redeeming all of your life, your physical body, your mind, your heart, because your heart is a house. And when you got saved, he took ownership of the whole house. But in the house are many rooms. And there are some rooms that you have locked up and you have put keep out signs in front of them. And even when the Holy Spirit comes and knocks on them, you cringe. You don't want him in there. But you see, Jesus has begun a process of knocking on every door and coming in. And this is the wisdom he gives you for that kind of salvation so that every part of your life gets drawn into the presence and the life of God. Amen. It says, well, it doesn't say this, I said this, that regular reading of Scripture opens your mind to God's truth. It says there that we are thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, the Bible has something to say about every topic. About every topic. Marriage, raising children, singlehood, social order, Pros property, justice and mercy, education, ecology, you name it. I mean, so many more. I, I clearly couldn't go through them all. But everything you face, in principle at least, you will find a scripture that will help you to navigate that situation. You know what is so beautiful about the Bible is that the Bible doesn't candy coat its heroes. One of the reasons we have those scriptures, passages that freak out, us out is that God was like, this is what happened. My hero, Samson, was caught by a woman because he was living a sinful life with her. And yet, I still used him to save Israel. That's how good I am. And what it means is that when we read the Bible, we see men and women who are just like us, navigating the same temptations, even failing all over the place, and yet God's still engaging with them and using them. And what it speaks to us, not that we can continue sinning, but that we, can, we don't have to, we're not thrown off the bus just because we made a mistake. But that we can engage with him and we can, we can allow him to, to heal us and pull us up and move us forward. So you see, Let's try that again. Regular reading of scripture makes you ready to do God's will. And if I want to put those two together, oh darn, I couldn't. But the regular reading of scripture, regular reading of scripture gives you capacity to be wise and it gives you capacity, gives, makes you ready to do God's will. 
it makes you ready to do God's will. Amen and amen. I know you probably have lots of questions. I probably, you probably didn't have questions before I started this, this sermon, and now you like, heck, I've got all those questions. But don't worry, we are going to tackle it again next year. Come to that apologetics course. I know that it will really help you. Amen. Um, an interesting thing, just in closing, um, I said that I, I read the Bible um, every day. I have a few days missed it for various reasons, but very seldom. And um, I've noticed that over the years, that in, in order to be someone who regularly allows the Word of God to touch my heart and to speak to me and to change me, that I need to set up rhythms and habits that allow me to do it. So I have this habit of whenever I wake up in the morning, I have a particular chair that was passed down from my grandmother to my mother to me. It's an old chair, but it's a beautiful chair, and it's just filled with the heritage, my heritage. And every morning, I've placed it in a place where the sun shines in, and I can see the garden, and I go and sit in that chair, and it's like I, I get a, um, a cup of tea from my husband, so I was like heaven, and I sit, I sit there, and I read my Bible. And you know, I, know, I make no um, requirement on me to get revelation or to find something. I simply imagine myself curling up with my heavenly father and allowing him to talk to me. It's like, Lord, okay, this, this is not about getting a sermon. This is not about knowing how to help my children. This is about you and me. You and me just having a conversation. And I open my Bible, and I read, and sometimes I read a lot, sometimes I read a little, and I have an engaging conversation with him as I'm reading it. Sometimes it's in my mind, sometimes I say it out loud, uh, and sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's half an hour, sometimes even I get carried away, and it's, it's an hour, and I'm late for work, confession. But you don't have to do that part. But it's, it's a place where it's just sacred for me and Jesus. And it's a relational space. And I find that day after day, my soul is transformed. So I want to invite you as we leave this place, that you you find your special sacred space. And it doesn't have to be the same as mine, but you find a place where you can take the pill every morning or every evening or every lunchtime. And that you can make it a regular part of how you live your life. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you.